to the Independent Investor Channel. This will serve as a closeout uh, to 2022 for the coverage on Highly on Holdings. It's been a uh, a real roller coaster ride covering the company. Uh, we will continue to cover the company, but uh, as these full years um, uh, come and they and they go, uh, these are probably the most important videos that I put out in my recovery of the company. For you guys that are new to highly on holdings, um, I am a share owner in the company um, with. Uh, probably just over about 20,000 aggregate shares, um, some long call contracts, as well as a base position of around 18,000 shares. Um, I am actually establishing a new position um, uh, of cash and monitoring the stock closely here as it's um, really sitting just south of the $3 mark. Um, I feel like we are um, just dabbling along a severely disconnected uh, bottoming of the company. Um, and based on this news here in 2022, closing and entering into 2023, I think it was um, the best quarter that I've covered uh, on the company. And for the summary in 2022, I think it's worth acknowledging that I've entered into quarters with zero expectations and not surprised at all by the lack of uh, of deliverance. Um, so my bottom line up front for you guys with regard to the 2022 uh, year end call for for closing out 2022 and uh, closing out the quarter Q4 quarter, um, I was extremely impressed. Now this uh, summary, um, from some of the uh, statistics that were put out there and, and pulsing the community. I think a lot of people thought that it was a muted quarter um, and a muted as expected quarter. Um, I am not trying to be a stick in the mud and, and be disagreeable, um, but I do disagree with that. I do. Um, I have a sheet of information here to talk about. I'm going to try in this summary to provide you as much of my insight as I possibly can, because we are working with a severely disconnected stock from the company. I've touched on this for many, many months. The disconnect cannot be any more real than it is now. The company is being priced in the stock market as a liquidation company. Okay. Right now, market cap sits at around, you know, 550 to 600 million on any given day. We're sitting on orders of 210 reservations, uh, excuse me, slots res, um, slots that are ordered and backed by deposits, 210, as well as an additional 2,000 in writing reservations. You take and you qualify those, you know, just over 2,200, um, let's just call them quasi orders, 210 of those we know are going to be filled by the end of this year. And the remaining 2,000 reservations represents a, a total top line revenue potential of close to a billion dollars, 884 million to be exact. Now, if Hylion realizes zero margin on any of those, we are talking about a massive revenue potential here, 210 of those orders. Um, we know is a foregone conclusion, okay? So 84 million of that is in the books. We know that, okay? So when we talk about a $2.1 million revenue going into close of 2022, which is an increase from 2021, um, going from no revenue booked uh, to revenue booked in um, the last five quarters. So you do have the first quarter dipping into uh, Q4 of, of 2021. And then um, the, the subsequent four quarters of revenue generation for the companies being driven specifically by hybrid EX sales. Very, very impressive here when we're talking about a baseline and a company that's being priced for liquidation. And you talk about one specific item, the, the elephant in the room and one of the questions at the, in the Q&A in the, the, the latest webcast, the actual call itself, spoke about providing color on the 2024 aside from just having a crystal ball. Well, we have more than just a crystal ball. We have reservations that have hit the books. Now, I'm not suggesting that those 2,000 are going to materialize into orders. I'm not suggesting that. 
okay? I figured actually where we would be if they realized, let's say half, all the way through 20, uh, uh, 2024, which th puts the company in a significantly different position and what it's being provided uh, um, uh, credit for here as a company that's being priced at a $3 company um, being given no credit for, for future sales, zero. And we're in that market right now where good growth, growth companies are being discounted, not being provided any type of, uh, of future credit uh, for projected sales and projected revenues. They're just not. Um, it's a tough financial market right now. We can all agree to that. But we do know the statistics that do surround what it is that we're looking at with Hylion Holdings, and that is 210. Uh, orders backed by deposits and 2,000 reservations. If you just kind of um, spec that out in in revenue potential, you know we're we're talking about a potential for a billion dollar uh, uh, top end revenue if that uh, gets fortified. Now I expect that reservation backlog to grow. I expect that that uh, order book to grow, right? So it becomes much more interesting on how much of that reservation order book they could fill in 2024. Is it 100? Is it 500? Is it half? Is it 1,000 orders? Those are the things that we can start to wrap our mind around based on the information that we know on the potential for top-end generating uh, revenue potential for the company. Now, the things that I'm going to talk about here are those exciting things, and I don't mean to get you excited. You do your own due diligence. I have. I share my insights through to help people, and that's it, okay? My my job is not to misconstrue you. Um, it's not to get you hyped up on a company that you do or do not want to invest in or maybe does or does not fit into your portfolio, okay? Hylion represents right now one of the largest positions in my uh, my portfolio, um, which is, you know, working with around, you know, a half a million dollars of net worth here. And um, we're looking to potentially fortify that position going forward. Uh, as I'm monitoring the stock, if the stock continues to go down, I will look at those strategic injects closer to the $2 mark um, at as the base at 206, monitoring the company at here at $3. Do I think I'm going to have my opportunity? No. Do I believe that if I'm going to enter into more shares now, I'm going to have to pay up for it north of that basing mark of 206? Yes, I do. Do I think anything less than $3 a share for this company with the revenue projections that I just outlined for you is an absolute bargain? Yeah, I believe that the company's right now is trading for free. It's trading for free. You're buying the shares free. Um, it's a token amount. You buy 100 shares of the company at $300, it's a gift. It's a freaking gift. Um, and so that that's... Really, the compare and contrast in what we know in relation to the current stock price here um, at, in March of 2023 here, and we'll reflect back on this time and we'll laugh ourselves right off of the chair because I, I look at it like right now, we are in a position to capitalize on an opportunity that doesn't come along very often, okay? Now, let's get into some of these points here because this call was rich uh, with um, with information. On a scale of 0 to 10, I give Hylian a 4 in this category. Um, they still have prospects and material uh, um, hurdles in front of them with regard to their uh, margin compression that they will have to succumb to. John Panzer talked about this. And then the ability to expand upon those margins based on what is going to be anticipated as a growing demand over their product and a fortification of their reservation and order book going forward, right? So a lot of things have to fall in line there. Um, I'm not going to award a company anything over a five for uh, expectations here, but I think the four is accurate in representing the fact that this company is brand new. It's um, it's new uh, and it's showing marked progress toward an end here. And a lot of that color was uh, introduced on the uh, webcast that was just released by Hylion, okay? Um, the first thing I want to talk about is 
that um, Thomas Healy talked about scaling the com uh, solutions to commercial quicker uh, and doing so based on the fortification of the relationships, especially with Peterbilt and Cummins that was realized in 2022. I talked about this company being one of those companies that would surprise based on Catalyst in 2022, these relationships being fortified with Cummins assisting with and basically collaborating with Highly on in 22, that was information we did not have prior to 2022, and now we do have. Thomas Healy spoke about that as a key generating factor in going to commercialization quicker um, and with uh, fewer barriers to entry to that commercialization end. I thought that was one of the big takeaways that I think you're going to find in this video, guys, as you stay with me, and most people who are interested in, they watch this video all the way through. You're going to find that I picked out and I've listened to the webcast not once but twice, and I encourage you to do there because you're going to hear some of the things that maybe you did not pick up on the first time you listened to, and I'm going to help you highlight some of the things that really stuck out to me. Those relationships with those major players like Cummins are key when we're talking about a company, comparatively speaking, that in the eyes of the marketplace, trading south of $3 is being discounted to the extent of potential liquidation. And, and I just think that to put a focus on that very disconnect can be very, very profitable for a lot of people out there, okay? Thomas Healy talked about the mandates, um, the slide in the um, uh, the PowerPoint that was reviewed, uh, I'm releasing a separate video on that to highlight the PowerPoint and the uh, ACT uh, ACF mandates as well. Uh, Thomas Healy, in multiple times during the call, talked about the eligibility to qualify along their entire suite of product portfolio. This is huge when we're talking about an ERX product that is powered by CNG RNG. We're talking about a Carno. ERX, and we're talking about a hydrogen fuel cell ERX, which we got solidification on the latter two in 2022. Guys, this is huge. Okay. If you guys had questions about what an agnostic uh, ERX would look like prior to 2022, we got that answer in 2022. If you had questions about whether or not Hylion was going to develop their hydrogen fuel cell solution in house prior to 2022, we just recently received those two answers on the latter 66% of Hylion's ERX product portfolio. This is why I'm so excited about this quarter, okay? I would give it a 10 out of 10 if the company was actually generating revenue based on the excitement that I have around these products that have yet to garner one single penny of revenue for the company, okay? And we will continue to evolve and we'll continue to cover what I feel like is very, very exciting. But with regard to the mandates, Thomas Healy talked about the um, specific eligibility each to each of those credits and doubled down on the uh, prospects of the company to be eligible for all of the mandates that are available and all of the incentives um, and rebates that are ex uh, uh, um, eligible to the fleets and to the OEMs through each of these mandates. A key takeaway for me during this call was, is plug-in dead? Um, it's a bold statement. Uh, it's one that I have my personal opinion on. I would expect that you would generate your own opinion on whether or not you think that the future is all Tesla uh, and it is all based around a plug-in future of having uh, dead semi-trucks on the side of the road uh, causing supply chain issues and rel reliability issues in an industry that for the last 100 years has been a very durable and very reliable industry in providing some certainty that our goods will end, or end up uh, from point A to point B in some sort of um, a predictable fashion. Um, BEV is failing on this front. Uh, it was discussed twice in the call. Uh, fleets are struggling. And that's a quote from Thomas Healy and the feedback that he's getting, uh, as well as a key executive in one of the companies that uh, has recently brought on uh, some BEV products and um, basically stating that as long as he's at the helm at the company, the company will um, never engage in the BEV uh, opportunity uh, again.
That is a bold statement. It's one that uh, I look at the landscape and it's very, very easy for me to discern. Um, I know there's people out there that are just all hail Tesla uh, at all costs. Um, I think BEV will have its place, but it's not going to have its place in the class eight space. And dare, dare I might suggest that they might just be uh, creating such a scar that they're going to have hard times uh, integrating in the class five to seven space uh, if they keep this up. Because I think they rush to market. I think it is uh, politically uh, driven uh, of an opportunity. I think realistically, when you talk about the size of the batteries necessary uh, to haul goods, number one, and the reliance of being uh, dependent on a grid to provide that power, it, it becomes uh, economically challenging. Uh, it becomes realistically challenging. Um, and it creates uh, hurdles to entry for the cost of some of these BEV rigs that uh, companies are declaring now that, yes, we are struggling and we will not be going with the BEV route, not until the technology can improve. It is expected to improve. But as of now, with these mandates that are looming, companies are coming back and they're struggling to identify with the BEV opportunity and how they can truly provide bottom line augmentation to keeping their customers happy in a reliable fashion by taking on the risk of moving to a BEV future right now. And I think that was a key takeaway from the, the call and dare I suggest um, plug in is dead. It is dead until proven otherwise, uh, I will continue to invest and put my um, money and my investing bullish thesis on this particular niche, micro niche in the industrial space, um, in range extender vehicles, um, hydrogen, which was doubled down multiple times on the call as being kind of a, a, a wave of the future as technology improves, and who's going to win out over time, hydrogen, plug-in, range extender, natural gas, low emissions type of profile vehicles for certain applications, and then no tailpipe uh, solutions in BEV and uh, hydrogen fuel cell solutions that are out there. All right. Um, learnings in the expanded treat uh, uh, trials, excuse me, the learnings that have gone on both in summer testing and winter testing were discussed during the call, and they will be integrated in this new expanded fleet trials, which is the next milestone in the progression of the company, which I thought was really, really interesting in that they have discussed the winter tr uh, trials and the summer trials as being um, very productive. Uh, Thomas Healy talked about the learnings that have been uh, paired off of those uh, uh, fleet, the, those trials, the winter and summer trials, but nothing that is concerning enough to uh, potentially uh, shift the um, uh, target date for commercialization to the right. So all on track, good to go. But I felt like there was some really good learnings that weren't really discussed. There was a few broad topics that were thrown out there. Uh, but just to know that those learnings will roll into the newest iteration of the expanded fleet trial iterations of the ERX once those are uh, once those are ready to go. Um, certification is on track. This is huge. This is the second to the last milestone. There are three la la left, and the next two are uh, check boxes as far as finalization of those. And then the last is just to roll out commercialization. So um, Thomas Healy talked about his uh, satisfaction with progressing along that um, that uh, checklist or roadmap toward commercialization uh, from Q4 of 2021, which goes back five quarters ago on when that initial rollout was presented to uh, the shareholder community as well as the investor community uh, on, on subsequent calls. Uh, and double down on the progress that's being made as being on track toward that uh, commercialization and and certification goal. Um, I think that's going to be a huge milestone uh, for all I can tell based on the 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 last um, performance of the company over the last, let's say, 24 months. They'll earn certification. The stock will go down to a dollar. Who knows? I mean, I just kind of say that tongue in cheek because um, this company has provided, at least the stock has provided um, very little to no energy as far as its ability to actually uh, see the value that I see in the company. And that's totally fine. It's given, <coughs> excuse me, people an opportunity to step into the stock at a very, very discounted 
um, a discounted time. And as long as those are prolonged, I'll continue to buy the stock. And like I've always said, they'll create a neon green monster out of me. It's no problem. If they want to make me a millionaire, that's totally fine. Um, these analysts who come on during the Q&A and they continue to work with arbitrary uh, price targets that are arbitrarily low from where the true value is on, in the company. I mean, look at the disconnect between where Hyzon is and their price targets at around five to seven dollars, trading at you know a dollar twenty seven a share. Highly on trading at three dollars a share, uh, with being at price targets right on par with where they are now. This these are supposed to be price targets that are six to twelve months out. And Hylion still is con continuing to enjoy uh, reduced price targets by these analysts who seem to be frothing at the mouth to ask all these questions about the potential of the company marking to marching toward a material opportunity for margin expansion, as well as the opportunity to realize an $884 million uh, top-end revenue mark with the current, and I might add the current, reservations and orders on the books right now, right now. That's assuming that when that 884 million is realized down the line, that they they will garner zero, zero continued reservations and zero continued orders backed by reservations from now until then. Um, so I fail to see the uh, rationale behind the low arbitrary price points, except for the fact that institutions are at a record high ownership of this company and retail investors are at a record low uh, of ownership because the company has been segued off and it's been parlayed and those shares have been picked up uh, and absorbed by the large institutions. I invest more in line with the institutions um, than I do with retail investors, and uh, that will continue for the remainder of my life. Um, that's that's no problem. I don't. I don't. For the most part, retail investor community are full of idiots, and the people who I respect invest like institutions anyway. Um, so, you know, do you want to continue to lose, or do you want to continue to get on board with this idea that's actually going to turn into uh, a, a, a progress of of material investing? Um, that is much more aligned with a long-term vision and less aligned with, I need to see performance in six months or, or I'm out, or I need to see performance in a month or I'm out, or the stock price has to hit X amount or I'm out. These are all rationale of the stupid and idiotic, and these applications have no place in investing, but what can I say? They're all too often resorted to as primary mechanisms to drive your investing thesis as opposed to the fundamental pieces that I'm actually outlining here. I got asked on my last Hylion video to actually explain my fundamental analysis on Hylion. That's exactly what I'm doing. This is fundamental evaluation on a company specifically, where a lot of people are investing on technicals in the market right now. The S&P has to come below 4,000 or, or 39.75 to invest, and therefore it, it can be bought. I don't play that game. I don't. Um, I've seen some people attempt to do technicals on Hylion. I think technicals are only applicable when you have uh, quantifiable metrics on a company that are not only forecastable, but also articulatable based on past performance. Right now, it's anybody's guess on where this company goes. And I'm trying to put some swim lanes around what we know of the company to drive a fundamental thesis on what we know and what we can potentially align as far as where this company could potentially go into the future, given a very, very wide swim lane, right? Okay. Um, expected to grow the order book that came directly from the CEO. Okay. So the figures that I talked about here, mind you, a 25% realized margin on the revenue that I talked about as a potential billion dollar revenue, um, sits at about, you know, 250 million on a billion dollars of sales, less than that 221 million you can see how some of these numbers can increase very, very quickly. And that's why a company that basically has immaterial revenue now is sitting in a position to really stare down the billion dollar top end revenue and they can get there fairly easily. Okay. Really just a, a few thousand orders can, can, can really change the trajectory of the company and what they have a realistic opportunity uh, to uh, to achieve. And you might say, well, that's unrealistic to say that they're going to uh, achieve that. Yeah, I don't know. When they talked about a, a key milestone of the company, and I'm going to talk about it with regard to, let's see if I can find it here in my notes. 
the first belt spec, spec line off of the Peterbilt line for Hylion? Are you kidding me? First, I've heard of it. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's talking about that um, a key milestone and something that they were internally excited about. I don't know if Thomas Seeley slipped. I don't know, but I've heard it twice now on the two times I've caught the webcast. But Peterbilt's first built spec line off of the OEM line devoted for Hylion. You want to tell me that they can't meet sales now? They can't meet a few thousand uh, units sold per year, which puts them into the billion dollar of, of top end revenue sales category. Um, you start to talk about whether or not they could actually do, you know, 2,500, 5,000, 10,000 orders as originally projected um, in the 2020 investor presentation, one that I'm very, very scrutinizing on. However, allow a small amount of uh, light to be shed on the fact that it is possible. It is possible. Uh, I think it was premature in releasing that information, yes, to generate generate hype around the company. But the scarier question to ask yourself is, could Hylion set themselves up in their integration with the OEM, not only Peterbilt, but their relationship with Freightliner as well, to generate, I don't know, 2,500 units a year? Is that is that impossible to project when right now we're sitting on about 2,500, uh, give or take, 2,210 orders to be specific of, 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 of income generating potential for the company, 210 guaranteed, 2,000 that have been earmarked for a potential conversion to orders? We're looking at a billion dollars right now, right now, 1 billion of top end revenue generating sales. Where does that put the company in way of valuation? Guys, it's not a $3 stock. It's a $50 stock at that point, 50. That's the way stock market investing works. Um, hate to remind you of that, but there's a few people in the retail investor community that think that they can apply uh, an elementary uh, mentality to this game and expect a win using elementary uh, application. Uh, if you want elementary application, go to the Yahoo thread, the cesspool of all things highly on uh, and and short dialogue and criticism over a company that I feel like right now uh, is the calm before the storm. And uh, um, we'll have the last laugh for sure. I'll be laughing my ass off all the way to the bank. And um, it'll, it'll be fun to reflect on uh, how that elementary application worked out for some of those people. Okay. Um, expected to grow the order book. Fleets want certification before orders. I found this to be a key. Thomas Healy talked about the resistance of fleets to commit to orders now prior to certification. It's something I've talked about on my videos in, in, in past. And I know there's people who listen to every word I say, and they should. They should. It could be very, very profitable for them. It could be. Um, I don't know. The company could go out of business, and then I can shut down the Hylion project and continue on with my life talking about fundamental investing. This just so happens to be a micro niche on a much grander uh, investing thesis that I have here about wealth building, okay? Thomas Haley alluded to the dialogue that he's getting from fleets that are very interested in the Hylion product, but want to see that final iteration, <coughs> excuse me, and certification come through for the company before they'll commit to orders. I found this to be extremely bullish, extremely bullish to understand that there are other interested parties out there, very big demand, okay, that also has in uh, consequentially uh, been uh, prompted by this BEV debacle that has come as of late and has provided more interest in the Hylion solution. This also was projected. This isn't my conjecture. This was said during the call, guys. You got to pay attention to this stuff if you're going to pick up what it is that you need to pick up to understand and either fortify your investing thesis going forward or discredit your investing thesis um, to which that you want to go ahead and surrender your investment in the company. These are the de hard decisions you have to make in investing. This is the big leagues, okay? There's no minor league stock market. This is the big leagues, all right? These are the things that you have to pay attention to. But when I heard that, I picked up on it the first time. I was like, right on. I know that there's interest going on behind the scenes, and I know that we will uh, 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 find and 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 really uh, realize those sales down the line when Thomas Healy talks about the expectation to 
uh, 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 fortify the existing reservation and order backlog, okay? Something that I've projected uh, throughout the course of covering the company. The white glo glove service clarity, I thought this was huge. I had something different in my mind. This is just an agreement with the original 200 that are rolled out. DSV will be part of it, okay? They just so happen to conveniently work and be working out of the Dallas uh, area. So without saying that DSV, yes, will officially be part of the white glove service in uh, one way or another, he said that they will absolutely be participating with Hylion, and, and that came through the clarity on the White Glove program to be more monitoring of the units and, and allowing uh, more eyes on the product on those first 200, understanding that they are super important to make sure that the rollout is as efficient and as uh, uh, seamless as possible on that rollout, whereas otherwise, when a fleet buys a product, that they wouldn't expect that that um, monitoring agreement exists. In other words, Hylion will have more of an opportunity to engage while the unit is actually in the rigor of Class 8 service uh, in the expectation that not only will they be, of course, and Thomas Healy said this, monitoring um, the uh, the progress of the units through their 24-7 cloud computing uh, progress, which is a revenue generating opportunity down the line, but the white glove service in its essence and in its core, and I didn't understand this before the call and now I do, is basically that um, over monitoring and that agreement with the fleets to understand that if they do have a problem, that they will be right there and receptive to that and the opportunity to take that data off those original 200 and incorporate those learnings into future iterations is the key, okay? So think of it as more of a scrutinizing opportunity for both the fleets that take receipt of these products and an opportunity for Hylion to really get in there and understand how those original 200 are performing uh, in the rigor, rigor uh, uh, by doing so with more of a monitoring scrutiny over those original 200. I think it's really, really smart. And initially, I was like, this is Class A trucking. It's dirty. Why the hell do we need a white glove service? Thomas Healy elegantly put this out there in explaining what this actually means for ramping up to those initial orders, yes, but making sure that that core nucleus of 200 is really over-scrutinized for the opportunity to not only potentially anticipate problems, but to deal with problems as they as they come up, whether it be small or large, and to have that agreement beforehand that Hylion will be right there to make sure that those um, those opportunities are 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 um, uh, are taken advantage of and learned from. Okay. Uh, the white glove. So the key, the biggest key takeaway for me is this, and aside from the highs on collaboration, but I've yet to hear people talk about this online. And I'm going to talk about it now. In a recent call with ACT with regard to the mandates and rollouts, exemptions will not be granted. This was the biggest takeaway. Something that Thomas Healy talked about as a big win for Hylion. I totally agree. I've seen rollouts of major systems in the government, and this is a normal posture of the government to say, look, the only way that we can ex exempt something from being applied for good reason against the merits of which I understand to be cleaner sustainability within the class eight fleet, the only way that those exemptions are going to be granted it is if there is um, no availability of product on the marketplace that meets the minimum performance standards in accordance with the initiative of the mandate itself. Okay, let me clarify. If there are no products available, the industry is going to come back and say, to hell with the environment. We need to run product. We're going to run so on diesel because there are no products available in the marketplace to integrate into our fleet. Therefore, we're um, you know, playing uh, this catch-22 type of game to say, look, until the industry can provide us a solution, we're asking for an extension to the mandate deadlines to continue to run diesel and not be penalized to do so. ACT has clarified and said that there will be no such uh, exemptions or extensions granted to the fleets. And this is in line with everything that I've seen over my last 20 years in my current 
uh, line of work and expertise on how the government deals with rollouts and big uh, incentive change outs uh, of of major uh, systems and machinery that do not have product availability or they do have product availability in either drawing a hard line and saying you have to switch and Thomas Healy used this term in that they are going to be forced uh, to 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 augment these new solutions uh, in the minimum percentages that are released and I thought that this was the one of the biggest key takeaways and um, I really anticipated the stock to uh, increase in value after this call. Um, the fact that it didn't just shows the amount of um, negative sentiment surrounding the stock currently. It's totally fine. Um, nothing new in my wheelhouse. Um, I think it's stupid. I think the fact that the stock didn't drop 25% after earnings was a positive in and of itself. Um, I think with the amount of positive news in this, I think the stock market's getting the stock wrong. Um, and again, I'll continue to profit from it. No problem. I'll calmly be accumulating shares in the company uh, at these anemic rates because basically I'm buying shares in a company free of charge. Um, and I just would say thank you very much. I'll continue to buy. Like I said, they'll create a monster out of me. It's no big deal. Um, exemptions will not be offered. One of the biggest takeaways there, regional application for hydrogen. This was also a big one that I don't hear a lot of people talking about with regard to the collaboration with Hyzon and discussing the few regional uh, opportunities with hydrogen, especially in the Los Angeles area where they do have hydrogen infrastructure there. Now, when I've said throughout the history of covering Hylion and, and my negative sentiment around Nikola with regard to the lack of hydrogen infrastructure, that's very real. That does not go away. There's some discussions about Nikola going bankrupt. Now, I'm not in that camp, but they have bet on a horse that the industry cannot feasibly adopt now, even though... They may have been pre premature to the game. Thomas Healy talked on multiple occasions that they still believe and have a bullish thesis on hydrogen being a big part of the future fuel uh, in transportation. Okay, He doubled down on it multiple times. My question has always been, what is the fuel cell iteration of the Hypertruck ERX going to look like? We got that answer. Just a couple of days ago, where we did not have that answer before, they've been very, very tight-lipped. There was no discussion about collaborating with Hyzon. But when he talked about the regional application, I think a lot of people missed the correlation between Thomas Healy up to this point has always suggested that long-haul trucking in the Class 8 space has always been the focus of Hylion. Did they not shift that a little bit? In looking at the potential to dive into a five to seven class eight mark uh, class market, in regional application, there was an, an an elusive comment that was made by Thomas Healy as far as far as the regional rollout of hydrogen availability, and where hydrogen can absolutely work, being such a new technology in regional application. I think there's a difference between just saying, okay, Nikola is saying we're going to dominate the Class H space with hydrogen. I don't think we're at that place now. I think that Hylion is well positioned to benefit from the over-the-road, ultra-long type of routes cross-country. But as far as the regional application in fuel availability for hydrogen fuel cell, does that not just by nature of fuel availability bound bind them to regional application to start, right? This is where Hyzon and collaboration with Hylion really shines in that Hyzon has customers. It was alluded to in the call and Hylion will be asked to go and pitch this iteration of this um, hydrogen fuel cell ERX with the Peterbilt chassis to those existing clients where Hyzon was not able to do that before. Collaboration makes total sense. It's the real bullish kind of top of the iceberg for this call and one that did receive some scrutiny in way of teaming up with a company that has been beat down with the market. Um, guys, there's been no company out there that hasn't been beat down with the market. The only company right now that people want to invest in and the statistics show that retail investors like the retards that they are, are pouring into Tesla 
in a fashion that has never been seen in the history of Tesla and the stock with regard to the inflows into the company doubling off of its uh, uh, $100 mark, now over $200 increasing by 100%. People are flooding into the company right now. And no other company is receiving any type of favor uh, in the um, in the stock market right now. Hyzon's no different. Now, Hyzon has um, uh, received the scrutiny, uh, justifiably so, with regard to their inability to um, to properly account for some of the financials uh, and some of those deficiencies in their uh, SEC filing requirements. Okay, so the scrutiny is very very real. But that doesn't mean that the, that the technology has somehow suffered from their inability to maintain their opportunity or their requirements with the SEC. It doesn't mean that. Um, Thomas Healy earmarked them as a leader in hydrogen fuel cell. And my friends, over the last two years, they are. And they are an international player, unlike Hylion. I just think that this collaboration fell on deaf ears. Uh, I'm not surprised that it did. But one that I would like to express my bullish thesis around and I'm super, super happy. I've always thought that at least the, over the last six months, Hylion needed to shake things up. And this is exactly what they did by acquiring Carno and collaborating with and fortifying their opportunity to break into the hydrogen fuel market. It puts them on a direct competition with the only player in the space, aside from Hylion and Hyzon, which is Nikola. And I feel like that strategic positioning cannot be understated. And I think to come up with any other thesis other than maybe neutrality based on the SEC submission deficiencies of Hyzon um, can look at this as really a bullish uh, type of positioning type of move for Hylion, one that they stand to benefit from significantly more uh, than um, than detract from their current business model. So I, I was I was extremely excited to hear the news and and that's just my twist on it, okay. The R and D spending in eighty uh, was eighty one million. Uh, John Panzer expressed this an increase from fifty eight million. That was specifically around the high um, ERX commercialization efforts. Um, those R and D efforts um, should actually increase here um, with the new initiatives uh, surrounding R and D for Carno and the R and D uh, that is going to be committed to the Hyzon project. Um, this is one bearish thing that I was kind of like, eh. You know, do they really have all this money to be spending on these initiatives? Well, if it fits into their uh, product portfolio of offering an ERX with a hydrogen fuel cell, is it not worth that those R&D dollars to go toward that initiative? I would argue yes, that it is. Um, so an increase in R&D spending, uh, uh, John Panzer talked about the 2023 spend being close to just shy of $200 million. Um, That will be based on um, uh, an unknown for the interest that they will receive and the sales that they will receive in-house in building out their sales book, um, as well as the Austin, Texas build out in their facility, which is very, very necessary, something that was discussed a couple of years ago and has really been put on, on hold. If you picked up on that in the call, they are refortifying their efforts uh, in that build out of the Austin facility uh, to be uh, more capable of their uh, research and development, their engineering specifications, um, and the good work that goes on at the Austin headquarters there for Hylion Holdings. Um, one thing that I took away from, and now that we know Hyzon is the um, hydrogen fuel cell technology collaborator going forward, that there are less regulatory hooks. So question during the Q&A was, is this going to uh, affect the roadmap for the current ERX projection uh, timelines for commercialization. Thomas Healy said no, and to expect that um, an iteration of that uh, hydrogen fuel cell will be available later this year, and its path to commercialization is going to endure less rigor uh, than the CNG RNG model because it's zero tailpipe emissions. And before this call, uh, I could not deem Hylion even having the potential to deem themselves a zero tailpipe emission company. Now I can. Now I can. 
every single dollar that's been fortified in this investment now has just been fortified even further because even a small amount of tailpipe emissions has to be dubbed that. And now they can boast that they provide a total holistic product portfolio that can exist for those applications that, yes, have small tailpipe emissions through uh, fossil fuel applications, CNG, RNG, et cetera, with the net negative solutions, especially with RNG that is absolutely very attractive, as well as the no tailpipe emissions here, all flying the flag of of, of Hylion. I think it's a win-win uh, across the opportunity, okay? Um, they've been challenged on their ability to be a true contender in the hydrogen space. That now has been answered. This was doubled down on Thomas Healy when fleets have come back and said, how is Hylion going to position themselves to uh, be available to fleets if we do make this commitment on the RNG side, be available to segue into a hydrogen fuel cell future? And I think that's why the collaboration with Hyzon makes so much sense right now in that it does position them to answer those questions and say, look, all of these things are in the works. Um, they would not commit to a date on when that was going to be available for showcasing. Um, however, it's reasonable to believe that within the next couple of years, um, they will have that product uh, and have all of the barriers to entry as far as OEM integration complete. And dare I suggest that the hydrogen model of the ERX may even be significantly easier to roll out to commercialization from the learnings that they've received uh, during this process of certification through um, the RNG CNG version of the Hypertruck ERX. Okay. Um, John Panzer talked about the potential for uh, negative margins. They're going to lose money on these first 210 orders. I could care less. We're talking about a disparity between what they're going to make on the onset and what they're going to potentially garner in the future. Uh, investing in Hylion at this point gives the most risk reward type of profile and understanding that um, we're setting up for future revenue potential here based on what we know. But he said that that would be a number one priority as opposed to, in conjunction with offering a commercially viable product. Um, that, that that the margin expansion was going to be the top priority in uh, realizing that margin expansion within their business for each unit sold and said that right now it's just economically um, uh, impossible to do so with the low volume, higher cost of uh, parts that need to go into these first iterations, uh, higher cost that they had to endure. Uh, over the last even couple of years to procure the necessary parts to ensure that these 210 could be turned off successfully. Um, and I, I and so I think there's um, um, indirect benefit from incurring those high costs and taking the margin uh, uh, um, the margin compression hit now um, with the opportunity that they'll have by pushing those products out now, and having those products available to the marketplace, I think this 210 that they have doubled down on and insured shareholders would absolutely be there and be delivered on time is a real win for Hylion. And it really speaks to the conviction of the company uh, to make sure that they could realize on those orders, even though bringing those to the marketplace has cost more um, than we would have liked if they were part of a much larger type of batch order uh, and or uh, fitted with components that will be earmarked for margin uh, uh, expansion because the idea is that each and every component that goes into the ERX can be bought in batch uh, and saving on those uh, components that go in there will only lend itself to margin expansion down the line. Uh, I thought that was a key takeaway from John. Um what else do we got? Fleets are planning more attention on Hylion. That's based on the uh, Bev debacle here as of late, which has really come to uh, really come to, into focus over the last couple of months with the Tesla product um, being introduced and and just having all kinds of problems with regard to the range that they're getting out of this. Um, it's anemic and almost stupid. Uh, I am a very logical observer, and if there were credit to be had there, uh, I would give credit. I, I think it's been nothing short of a disaster. 
to be honest with you, which this disaster where there has been focus on electrifying the fleets uh, from a BEV perspective, uh, a lot of those uh, barriers to entry have only uh, contributed to the renewed focus on Hylion. And Thomas Healy talked about this during the call in, in that now where they might not have garnered uh, said success based on fleet's focus on BEV, um, they're starting to abandon in some unique cases the, the BEV altogether, um, which is uh, creating a shift in focus to Hylion and what they bring to the table with regard to their product portfolio. Okay. Uh, John Panzer talked about no plans to raise capital um, in the near term. I think with 420 in liquid assets on the books, I think that's a fair statement. I think we do have a capital raise at some point in our future. I think we're premature of that. And I think John's answer spoke to that. I think once we get a little bit of strength in the stock, eight to ten dollars, eight to twelve dollars, um, ten to fifteen dollar range, I think will be an optimal time for Hylion to make that first big capital raise. Uh, and I would like to see the hook there. Uh, in opportunity in ex expanding globally, because everything that has been discussed right now is in the acute, talking about penetration and rollout in the domestic market. But remember, Hyzon is an international player already. Okay, so it begs that question of what this collaboration could mean for Hylion to expand globally sooner than later. Okay, and I think some of those capital raise discussions will absolutely take place within the next 12 months. I don't think we're going to be looking at a capital raise from 12 to 24 months down the line. Um, if I'm wrong on that, no problem. But it certainly does beg this idea that we're in kind of a kind of an interesting phase and transition uh, from the company, you know, burning down SPAC dollars to get them to and, and fortify this position to step into uh, commercialization phase in a healthy manner, uh, and then to assist with those uh, commercial efforts down the line. Now, remember that Hylion does enjoy a capital lean business model in that how much expansion needs to happen. Would they build a new facility? Um, would they build a, 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 an international facility to um, to potentially work international footprint, uh, continuing to expand their team of experts uh, and engineers is obviously going to carry with it uh, more CapEx and OpEx, which it would be expected to grow uh, uh, um, north of their $130 million projection right now per year. Um, that will grow with the company, right? To, so to solidify that and take advantage of a healthy um, position in the stock market and a, and a healthy valuation, um, which at that point would probably put them, you know, closer to the $850 billion valuation mark is probably in order, um, but something that John Panzer did not speak about here, just uh, outside of suggesting that the current capital on the books, um, totally funded through 2023, which is a non-effort um, uh, spending just south of $200 million for the year. Um, which is the highest spend year ever. Um, but we have some initiatives in the early stages that we need to see some some real progress toward. He talked about the 3D printing machines uh, to be purchased, which I think is probably in conjunction with the uh, expansion of the Austin facility to um, start along that $100 million infusion into the Carnot project and to get that Carnot project to a position where they're mass producing the Carnot. These are some interesting initiatives um, that are a, a, a lot of years down the line, but you're not going to be given a $3 stock price once these things start to come into fruition, guys, okay? You're being given a gift right now, and dare I suggest the $3 stock price right now, is in, it's, in, it's laughable. Um, you're getting the company for free um, and things in life that are free um, that are this high a quality are very, very rare uh, in this life. So thought I would push that out there. Okay. So no plans to raise uh, Peterbilt uh, being the first built spec line for Hylion. Uh, this has not been talked about. It, it was not talked about in the discord group. The, the most I could tell. And I found that this was a big oversight and one that I wanted to uh, shed light on in one of those things that Thomas Healy said was a huge milestone for the company internally. And it came out on the call. Nobody talked about it. Nobody's uh, discussed it after the fact. I'm here to highlight that that was a big freaking deal. If they're going to realize orders in the amounts of hundreds at a time and dare I suggest thousands and dare I, dare I, dare I suggest tens of thousands of orders, which 
puts the stock north of 100, 100 and a half to $200 a share, okay? They're able to realize on what we know now, we're talking about a 25 to $50 stock, okay? With the 884 uh, million dollars of of revenue projected now based on what we know. Guys, we know it. It's there. The data is there. It's how you choose to interpret the information. And some may suggest that I'm conveniently interpreting the information. Fair enough. But the information, the, the, the 2,210, let's call them orders slash reservations, that's a fact. That That's not conjecture. That is a fact. Now, if I'm going to say that the company will have by 2025 10,000 orders, that's conjecture. That's dialogue that I try to refrain from and frame as conjecture. But is it not safe to suggest that Hylion is not going to improve upon their order book and reservation, uh, that their order book and reservation back order log going forward? I, I'm not I'm not in that camp. And as an investor in any company, you have to be able to look at the forward potential of a total addressable market of one trillion dollars. One trillion dollars. We're not offering extensions. We're looking at very few companies that offer zero tailpipe emissions. Hylion is one of those now with its collaboration and will have a viable product in that in that round. And by the end of this year, in a few short months, we will have a Hylion Hypertruck ERX that is capable of driving net negative carbon emissions with the uh, with the use of RNG. Very exciting times here. And the 884 is presuming that they garner zero. In all fairness to the critics of me and my message and my bullish thesis around the company, I'm being fair in just saying, okay, I acknowledge that they won't garner any more orders the remainder of 2023, which by the nature of what I've just covered in this call is physically impossible. They can't do that. And I'm offering it as a zero potential. If they garner no more orders or reservations going forward, they should be able to get close to that billion dollars of, of revenue. Whether or not it's realized over the next coming years, whether or not it takes two to five years to realize some of those reservations and roll those off the reservation and turn them into orders, is it, it, it's, it's irrelevant at this point. The fact is that they have them on the books, which speaks to the interest over the product and the prospects of the company going forward, all right? The last thing that I'll mention, I'm not going to mention the collaboration with Hyzon. We touched about that, that really being the governing takeaway from this call. But something that I picked up on that uh, Thomas Healy talked about, and he hesitated before he said it. He said, fleets will be forced to comply. And I think this comes back to one of my major takeaways from this call in understanding that we will not be wagging this proposal. I believed that this had sticking power and it was reaffirmed based on that comment that there will be no extensions granted to fleets that are running currently boom diesel as we speak. And as I'm filming this video, we're burning diesel. But in, a, in, a, in accordance with a cleaner sustainability goals, of both the ACT and the ACF mandates that are coming through, um, the incentives that uh, uh, are being put out there to the fleets to to not to not be combative with this, but to uh, um, collaborate with and to be uh, acceptive of and to allow the augmentation to happen of the fleets. I think this is this is key. And when you step back and you draw a rhetorical question of where Hylion will be in this. Guys, there's no better company positioned for the augmentation of fleets in accordance with the current mandates than Hylion Holdings Limited. Right now, Hylion is the number one player in the space with a total addressable market of over $1 trillion currently trading on the New York Stock Exchange at an anemic $3. You're getting the stock for free. And it is absolutely as a pleasure of mine to present this information in the way that I have codified in this video. There's been no more important video than this 2022 closure video. And as we continue to cover this company, I would expect that an evolution in the story takes place and that I have always stated 
that the real bullish thesis in Hylion exists in the unknown rather than the known, and 2022 was no short of delivering on the unknowns that we were not privy to in 2021 that we are now privy to in closing down 2022. Guys, if you appreciate the content coming through the channel, I'd invite you to subscribe to the Independent Ambassador channel. It's one of the most badass channels on YouTube. I don't deaf around. It's pretty cool. I speak commonplace to people, and that's what people resonate with. These are my opinions. I would invite you to go to highlyon.com, draw your own distinction about the company that is the beauty of social media, and coming to a consensus on not conjecture, rather what we know about a company and identifying those disconnects in the market that we have going on right now. This is the calm before the storm. And I would invite you, my friends, to look at these because these opportunities do not come very often. And I believe that this is an opportunity in the making, one that cannot be overlooked and the one that we continually need to cover on the Independent Investor Channel. Leave your comments at the bottom. Hit the notification bell. You will be notified of future videos that I put online on YouTube. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in for the totality of this closing down of 2022 Q4 conference call for Highly on Holdings. Appreciate you guys tuning in and good luck in your investment future.